Hello, I'm Ed Comentale, Director of the IU Bloomington Arts and Humanities Council, and this is Quarantine Conversations. Really excited to introduce this event tonight. Um, it's an exciting event for arts and humanities camp, uh, community on campus. Um, Quarantine Conversations is a seven week program airing on Tuesday evenings on Facebook. Uh, and it is focused on arts and humanities and particularly the ways in which the arts and humanities can provide perspectives and frameworks uh, for understanding uh, the current historical situation, uh, the coronavirus, as well as its historical, social, and cultural dimensions. Um, this program started as soon as the shelter in place order went into effect for the state of Indiana. And as my colleagues and friends began to hear about the campus restrictions, um, they were eager, they were itching to share their work. This is what artists and humanists do. They analyze, they create, they exchange ideas, and they teach. And that's not going to stop because they're stuck at home. Um, we also began to hear about the important work being undertaken by faculty scientists, social scientists, doctors, and healthcare practitioners. And we began to mobilize and think about the ways in which the arts and humanities can provide their own expertise and knowledge in helping us understand and deal with the current situation. Humanists are experts at providing historical context, exploring cultural differences, weighing ethical choices and deliberations, and analyzing and evaluating different forms of expression, whether they be speeches or films or poems. Artists have amazing capacity for understanding the uses of materials and the qualities of good design, of exploring different modes of expression and the way that the emotions can be channeled through them. Also in mobilizing form and art in general to create community. We're gonna be hearing from history professors, literature professors, philosophy professors, people who study religion, critical race, critical gender. We'll be hearing about from artists and actors and singers, musicians and creative writers. They're all going to help us explore what we're all going through in different ways. This is very exciting and inspiring for us to be able to share our work with you in this way. Quarantine Conversations is a collaborative program. One of the key features of this is that it represents a partnership between the IU Bloomington campus and the IUPUI campus. The program was founded and it's produced by me and my partner, Jason Kelly, who's a director of the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute, as well as a professor of British history. I'd like to give a shout out to Jason. He helped plan this program and he'll be hosting it next week. I'd also like to give thank you to the Indiana Humanities Program, especially Leah Nemius, Director of Programs and Communi Community Engagement for Indiana Humanities. Our work is enlivened each year, each week of the year by our collaborations with Indiana Humanities, which helps us reach audiences all across the state. I encourage you to visit the websites of both the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute, as well as Indiana Humanities, and follow them on social media to learn more about the great work that they're doing for the Hoosier State. Tonight's program focuses on history. It's an excellent topic to start with. We have four amazing scholars who are going to talk about plagues and epidemics of the ancient and recent past. Our first presenter is Colin Elliott. He's an assistant professor in the Department of History at IU Bloomington and an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Classical Studies. Colin studies economic and social connectivity in the Roman Empire. And his first book is coming out in 2020. It's titled Economic Theory and the Roman Monetary Economy. One key feature of this program is that we've asked each of our presenters to start with a material object to get their talk going, a hook of sorts um, that they can begin to discuss and address as a way of leading into the discussion as a whole. Colin's object is bay leaves. And his talk is titled Quarantined Among the Laurels, A Leap Flight During the Antonine Plague. Uh, please join me in welcoming Colin Elliott. Thank you. Ed, thank you so much for that uh, warm welcome. And of course, I'm very excited to be a part of this fantastic program. What a great idea. Yeah, so as Ed mentioned, I'm starting off with a discussion of laurel leaves. Uh, we call them, of course, bay leaves. Uh, they come from the Laurus nobilis tree, which is an evergreen laurel tree that is native to the Mediterranean. Of course, this is my area of study, ancient Rome, which is a Mediterranean empire. The ancient Romans, of course, not only used these leaves for cooking, as we do today, 
But laurel leaves were also symbols of victory and symbols of health. Uh, as you may be aware, Roman emperors and triumphant generals wore laurel crowns in public as a sign uh, that they had won an important military victory. And if I can pull my screen up here, I may be able to show that to you right now. Let's see if we've got that going. Uh, hopefully you're seeing uh, the, uh, a, a, an image from the Arch of Titus, which shows a Roman triumphal uh, procession. Uh, and uh, you can see there uh, the victorious general there. This, in this case, this is the Emperor Titus, uh, and he is uh, being overshadowed by a slave who is holding uh, a uh, crown of laurel over his head. Now, the slave would whisper softly into the triumphator's ear, remember that you are mortal while holding that crown of laurel leaves. Now, sensible emperors knew that they were not actually gods, even when they wore the laurel crown. But the Roman emperor Commodus, and that's the emperor that I'd like to talk a little bit about today, was not a sensible emperor. His reign, which uh, many historians mark as the beginning of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, was intimately connected with plague, a quarantine, and laurels. During the reign of Commodus's father, uh, Marcus Aurelius, this is Rome's philosopher king, or at least that's how he is remembered as a, as a philosopher and emperor at the same time. Uh, under Marcus Aurelius, the Roman Empire was afflicted with, uh, with a plague uh, from AD 165 to AD 190. Uh, it's called the Antonine Plague, and during a period of about 25 years, this disease, which was a form of smallpox, probably killed somewhere between one and five million people in the whole of the Roman world. Retrospective diagno uh, diagnoses of plagues like, like this one are very difficult to perform, so we really can't know exactly uh, which pathogen was responsible. We think it was smallpox, but we don't ultimately know. And uh, it's also very difficult to assess the full impact of the disease. There are, however, some surviving stories from the period, which suggest that the disease was highly contagious and thrived in high-density urban populations. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us that the Antonine Plague was virulent in the city of Rome, the empire's capital, which contained about one and a half million people, the most populous city in the ancient world by quite a large margin. Rome was crammed with people living right on top of each other, uh, usually in quite unsanitary conditions, I have to say. The population density of Bloomington, Indiana, just for comparison, is about 1,500 people per square kilometer. Now, if we take the most dense, densely populated city in the modern world, that's Manila in the Philippines, uh, that city has about 42,000 people per square kilometer. But Ancient Rome had still about double the population density of modern Manila, about 75,000 or so people per square kilometer. Imagine trying to do social distancing in conditions like that. No, once a, conda uh, once a contagion entered the city of Rome, uh, which it appears to have done, in the spring of AD 189, it moved quite quickly. And that's the year that I want to focus on. So I mentioned focusing on Commodus, and now you've got a year, the year 189. During the year 189, the emperor Commodus had been in sole power for nine years. He took over in 180 after his father, Marcus Aurelius, had passed away. Commodus at the time was 28 years old. Uh, however, he was widely known as a self-absorbed narcissist who cared more about his popularity with the crowds and living a debauched life uh, than he did with governing the city of Rome and its empire. So when the plague flared up in 189 AD in the city of Rome, Commodus chose to flee the city. Yes, he quarantined himself in his villa in the small coastal city of Laurentum, which is about 15 miles from Rome. The city is named Laurentum because it has vast groves of laurel. And this was especially true of the emperor's villa, which was surrounded, we're told, by groves of laurel. And the emperor's physicians believed that Commodus would do well to walk in the shady groves and smell the sweet scent of those bay leaves, 
Uh, the Romans believed that the leaves of the laurel are not only pleasant and pungent to the nose, but they actually uh, provide a strong enough scent to create a wall of smell, a fragrant barrier that blocked any noxious and disease-laden fumes from entering the body. In fact, even if a person was infected with a sickness, uh, dried laurel leaves along with incenses and essential oils were placed around the person in the hopes that the healthy smells would enter the body and uh, the, uh, the noxious fumes of, of whatever disease was afflicting them would then be pushed out. The emperor didn't go into quarantine all by himself. He did bring his mistress, Marcia, into quarantine with him, and she, she, and sh and, and sh and, uh, she made sure that uh, no word of what was happening in Rome, the horrible plague that was afflicting the city, could reach the emperor's ears while he was quarantined. So he was quarantined both from the plague, but also from hearing about the plague as well. Uh, what an admirable leader Commodus was. Uh, for Commodus and for many of the elites in Rome, the ability to flee Rome's crowded neighborhoods and quarantine in country villas was really quite a rare privilege. Most inhabitants of ancient Rome did not own country villas. Most inhabitants of ancient Rome could not afford to stop working. Uh, certainly, in many cases, they were slaves and not even allowed to stop working. So, uh, you know, even in the midst of a deadly pandemic. Instead, in imitation of the emperor, they bought laurel leaves. This is what we're told by the Greek historian Herodian. They decided to imit imitate Co Commodus by buying laurel leaves, essential oils, and incenses uh, in the hopes that the fragrant smells would drive out uh, the deadly pestilence, which had uh, uh, wafted about, which was wafting about in the city. Some even bought charms from hucksters that suddenly spawned in the bull market for talismans and trinkets. We know that one particular charlatan, this was a uh, Greek named Alexander, uh, was traveling around the Mediterranean convincing people that they should worship a snake god named Glycon and uh, they should inscribe charms and wards uh, above their doors to ward off the Antonine Plague. Meanwhile, of course, crowds of people swarmed temples of the more traditional gods and sacred spaces, petitioning these deities for healing. They offered prayers, they offered vows, small offerings, even coins, anything to keep them and their loved ones safe from the deadly plague. Unfortunately, of course, as we can imagine, none of these measures were really very effective. In fact, quite the opposite. Imagine this, right? By crowding into temples, the inhabitants of Rome unwittingly created clusters of available hosts sufficient to keep the pathogen moving through the city's population. We're in fact told by one Roman senator uh, who lived through the plague. His name was Cassius Dio, and because of him, we have a, a history of this period. Uh, he said that around 2,000 people a day were dying of plague in the city. Cassius Dio, we don't know how he came by this information. He's obviously not counting bodies. There probably weren't very good records kept, but uh, either he was there in the city of Rome and sort of had an anecdotal perspective on, of, of many multitudes of people dying, or maybe he had sources in the city. Either way, he records the fiasco that ensued while Commodus was quarantined in Laurentum among his groves of laurels. Commodus, instead of placing senators in charge while he was away, uh, he appointed a former slave named Cleander, one of his uh, intimate uh, friends and, and uh, household uh, servants, to supervise the city of Rome. Cleander had accumulated quite a bit of power and influence with the young emperor at this time. Cleander, however, didn't really supervise the city of Rome, as Cassius Dio tells us, so much as exploit it. He used his power and position to buy up and subsequently hoard what little remained of the plague-stricken city's grain supply, which was already perilously low because the grain ships from Egypt were yet to arrive in the city. Soon the city was both sick and starving, and the desperate population turned violent and riots broke out. Commodus, however, was kept in quarantine. Neither the plague nor the bad news from Rome was allowed to trouble him. So plague and famine and now violence in the city of Rome. 
Early in the summer, these things spilled out of the city as a desperate mob of citizens marched to Laurentum, to Commodus's secluded villa. The commotion alerted the guards who charged the gathering and began murdering, butchering as they stood, the, the rioters. Marcia, whom Commodus had taken with him into quarantine, could no longer withhold the truth from the emperor, and she told Commodus about everything, about the famine, about Cleander's grain hoarding, about the riots. Now, Commodus was either too clever or too narcissistic, probably a little bit of both, uh, to blame himself. Of course, he didn't take on the blame himself. He, he did the thing that most narcissists do, and they blame other people. Uh, he instead offered the mob a scapegoat. He sent summons to Cleander at the city of Rome, and when the freedmen arrived, Commodus had him executed on the spot. Commodus was no statesman, but he knew how to satisfy a frightened, violent, and frankly, angry mob. He gave them Cleander's head. The threat of plague then subsided in the summer of that year, and the grain ships from Egypt arrived. Commodus then broke quarantine. He left his villa in Laurentum. It may have been better for the Romans, however, if he had stayed there. The emperor returned to Rome with delusions of his own grandiosity. The emperor had survived the plague. He had thus defied death, proving himself to be a divine being. He proclaimed himself, according to the Greek historian Herodian, a Roman Hercules, an invincible and invulnerable demigod. Hercules was the son of Zeus and therefore the son of Jupiter. So while among the laurels, Commodus, Commodus had no slave to remind him that he was mortal. Although Commodus was so deranged, it probably wouldn't have mattered anyway. Commodus took himself from private seclusion to public exhibition. So to, to display his divine powers and to receive worship from the masses in Rome, he staged elaborate gladiatorial battles in the Colosseum where he himself fought and killed exotic animals, prisoners, and even a few famous professional gladiators. To this day, we have coins and statues, which you just saw, and now medallion, which should be on your screen now, which depict the emperor as Hercules. He's nude, he's carrying a club, and wearing on his head not the laurel crown of victory, uh, but the lion skin of Hercules. The Romans had exchanged one plague for another. Commodus himself was the sickness. The senators could hardly go into quarantine to escape Commodus. Neither could they defy the emperor openly. In fact, we're told by Cassius Dio, that senator that survived the plague, that it became increasingly difficult not to burst out laughing in public at the emperor's antics. But here too, just as they used laurel to ward off disease, not members of the Roman Senate turned to laurel leaves to help them endure the plague of a bad emperor. And Cassius Dio takes a break in his Roman history to give this anecdote, this little bit of information about his own experience, saying that he chewed bay leaves, he chewed laurel leaves to keep from laughing in public as Commodus embarrassed both himself and also made a mockery of his office. Commodus soon found out that he was not divine. In December of AD 192, just a couple of years after the plague, Marcia, Commodus' mistress, who had protected him while he was quarantined at Laurentum, was the one who slipped the poison into his dinner one December evening. When the emperor began sweating and vomiting from the poison, his bath attendant then finished the job by strangling the emperor. The Senate ordered his body drugged through the streets. Many of his statues, Hercules, look, you know, dressed as Hercules, wearing the lion skin of invulnerability, were knocked down and destroyed. His memory was condemned. His grandiose proclamations, such as his insistence that Rome be named Commodiana or that the months of the year be renamed after his various names and titles, these were all reversed. Commodus was unpopular with the Senate during his first 10 years as emperor. After all, he taxed, mocked, and marginalized them. But the plague in 189 AD and then the emperor's quarantine 
seems to have coincided with Commodus's acceleration into megalomania. By isolating himself from the Antonine Plague, Commodus also isolated himself from reality. He survived the disease, but lived to become a plague himself. Writing of Commodus's antics, Cassius Dio said that Commodus was a greater scourge to the Romans than any plague or any pestilence. Laurel leaves may have been ineffective against the Antonine Plague, but against Commodus, they kept the Senate from laughing, allowing them to survive and subsequently eradicate, eradicate the disease that was their immortal emperor. Thank you so much, Colin. Uh, that was an amazing presentation and incredibly timely. My um, head is just reeling from the comparisons, as I know many of our listeners are, are feeling the same kind of um, dizziness. Uh, and it's particularly interesting to think of, of the bay leaf as the chloroquine of its day. Uh, I, I was also, you. I was tempted to say something about Commodus having total power as well, but uh, I decided not to. I'm sure listeners will draw their conclusions. And Colin will be back in a little bit um, to answer questions from the audience. Uh, thank you so much, Colin. Um, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Ann Carmichael. Uh, Anne is Professor Emerita uh, in History and the History of, and Philosophy of Science and Medicine at IU. Uh, she studies the history of medicine and public health, especially during the medieval period with an emphasis on epidemiology. Uh, she is the author of Plague and the Poor in Renaissance Florence, and she has taught a well-known and beloved course uh, titled The History of Epidemics at IU Bloomington. I'll let her introduce her object in a second. Her talk will focus on the Italian plague of 1629 to 1631, spaces of care and quarantine, local memory, and distortions of the temporal and spatial scales of great epidemics. Welcome, Anne. Please begin. Thank you. Um, I have um, I have actually two objects, one of which Ed and Jason provided in linking um, these, this series to an article that they found particularly powerful in the New York Times. And I'll start with that. I'll switch over to my um, shared screen and presentation, not as elegant as Collins, but there's some interesting overlapping themes. So let me share my screen with you um, uh, to show you um, the first of those two images I put the name of the artist Anthony Van Dyke and Saint Rosalie in pink because pink is Saint Rosalie's color. She was a, uh, a, uh, a uh, well, she was she was a little odd. Um, this is the oh dear, it looks like you will not be able to see it completely uh, on the side, but maybe that's not so bad in this case. Um, Rosalie uh, was uh, found, or at least her bones were, she supposedly lived in the mid 12th century. And during the plague in, um, in Palermo in 1624, uh, um, she, her remains were found and she was brought out uh, in a procession to, um, to help save the, the Spanish Viceroy, who was sick by early August. Um, so the story in the New York Times um, was a prompt for me because it read, quarantined in a foreign city, the young Fleming watches in horror as the port closes, the city gates slam shut, the hospital overflows, the afflicted groan in the street. Well, actually not, <laughs> not how it happened. And so one of the things that I was really uh, particularly interested in is the size of quarantine spaces. We ourselves, um, well, we're, we're speaking from our own, our own homes and that's more like the privileged uh, of uh, the, the quarantine in Palermo. It's what Van Dyck himself, and he was there from about almost precisely 396 years ago from sometime in April um, of 1624 and finally able to leave in September of 1625, go back to Genoa, then home um, and, and the like. So the image that you are seeing is the one in the Metrop uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art that was itself quarantined 
Uh, it was uh, one of the first uh, paintings that the, the Metropolitan Museum acquired and why it was in, it was planned for that uh, demonstration. Rosalie is connected to plague, though you'd never quite know it. Here in this particular image, the only thing that tips towards that plague is the little puto, the, the, the cherub, um, chubby baby, on the, who's not completely in the frame. Uh, he's holding his nose and he's pointing to a skull. And the skull was the principal relic uh, for Saint Rosalie. Other, uh, other than that, what we have is not laurel leaves, but a cherub arriving to crown her with roses, her, um, her own uh, uh, symbol. Um, Rosalie, I, I was I'm interested in a number of things about this particular case, um, and um, looks like I can't use that. So I, I wanted to go to the image that um, is, uh, I, I think, the first one that Anthony Van Dyke actually uh, painted sometime in September of, uh, of 1624, when this plague was uh, really becoming quite, uh, quite virulent. Um, and um, it, he was paid by um, the, the viceroy uh, who stepped in after the init initial uh, viceroy died. He was there to paint all of these rich men uh, and their portraits, um, but he got um, uh, redirected to painting a series of um, uh, uh, images of Saint, of Saint Rosalie, and in fact, uh, it, it they became enormous, enormously famous in Baroque art, and were used as a model for many other things. In this particular image, done in 1624, uh, the best his, art historical work suggests that it was the very first one done uh, for uh, this series of paintings. He he did well. He was in a privileged uh, quarantine. Um, and uh, but Rosalie was to there to aid the entire city, so he's pointing to an area um, uh, on on the left, and I've got a close up of that to show you the detail of where isolation took place. There, there are two things that have interest me, interested me: the persistence of memory about these plagues. Colin just talked about a very interesting erasure of uh, particularly unwanted memories. But in this case, um, the, um, the, the, the city very much to this day has an annual festival of some size um, on the 14th uh, of July. I don't know if they'll have it this year, but this is where quarantine took place for those who could not remain at home. The, the, the rich in this case understood it as their obligation to pay for the plague, to, um, to pay all of the, um, uh, the various workers, the people who cleaned uh, the houses, the people who took the sick to this large area. It was an entire suburb of the city that was involved in, uh, in, in this plague. Um, it was uh, on the beach. And people went through a sequence. They were there first if they were sick. They went to one place. They went to uh, another if they were only suspect household contacts. They, if they survived, they had to do a lengthy quarantine in yet another place. And then after quarantine was finished, they did a purification um, sense, which is really, uh, really interesting. They were asked to strip down. The men and the women were always separated. Families were separated from one another, uh, which is not what the wealthy had uh, experienced. But they had to wash themselves thoroughly in the sea. So the port was very much involved. An interesting um, uh, 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 lead-in to what was my uh, otherwise original um, uh, image. Uh, of the city that it uh, that I study now and have done for some time. I haven't uh, been back to Florence. I wanted to show you one of the most famous uh, pest houses or lazarettos um, uh, in uh, in plague history. The plague 
1624, it's a plague cycle, to 1634, is uh, second to the Black Death in its magnitude in all of the, um, uh, the uh, in, in the number of places it affected, in, um, in the mortality levels. The plague in Palermo was uh, of 1624 to 25 was its worst. 10,000 people out of around 30,000 uh, did not survive. So, uh, but in, in Milan, it was even more punishing. Uh, an estimated 80,000 people out of a generously sized uh, uh, population uh, going into the plague of 200,000. So uh, quite brutal in this plague. So I wanted to talk about this, um, uh, the, the persistence of memory in this case with a votive image that was created um, in the, uh, at, towards the end of this plague at the end of December uh, in 1630 by a prior who uh, worked for a particular community. And the, the word Madonna of Tinchit is um, is a local um, uh, dialect of Italian, Meneghin. I can't I, I can't understand it, so I use uh, a dictionary for it. This is the image that was reproduced, was repainted in uh, in 1890, um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you more about that on the next slide. Um, the uh, image, the uh, wood woodcut, actually, it's fairly crude and. Uh, dating probably from the 18th century, shows the relationship of the elements uh, in, in this street art um, that was to comfort people coming back from the great Lazaretto. And you can see better on the right what is featured in the oval at the bottom of two large frames, and that is the, uh, the Lazaretto. I'm just going to show you more of that. We can barely see it over here um, in, uh, in, in the painting itself. Um, I don't think the, the painting has survived. It had done, but um, bombing in World War II, I think, was oh, what led to its dismissal. Okay, so I have cut off uh, the screen. Um, uh, my screen, so you can't see this, but I'll have another image to show you um, that you read this this particular um, vignette from the left to the right, and uh, I will show um, the the, um, the the people being taken to the lazaretto, taken away from their homes because their homes were not grand enough to allow the sick person uh, an isolation place. Um, the cart coming across the bridge is coming across a canal, navigable canal that completely surrounded this walled city. Um, the cart would have gone to one of two places. One in the front door, which is in the middle of the frame that you see, probably here, um, uh, which is where uh, still living victims would, uh, of, of plague would come and be blessed. Um, uh, receive last rites, and then he suggests that um, a little cart would take them into this compound, which means we need to understand just how very large this was. Especially, I was doing a rough calculation from, uh, from Collins, this is uh, a 15 hectare space. It's really quite large, um, but since up to 12 maybe even as many as 15,000 people could have been in there at once. That's 120 to 150,000 people per square kilometer. It's a little crowded. Um, so, and then over here on the left is the graveyard, and I'll show you, hopefully it will uh, not be cut off, some of the, uh, the parts of this. This is, this is the part to the right, the city side, where the prior Bern Bernardo Cotoni, um, uh, uh, is uh, a, identifies himself, and I'll show you his little picture uh, on the next. And then you, now you can see better the carts uh, coming across the bridge over uh, over the moat um, by the person who would go before all the carts. Uh, and this was in all cities; they would they would have this person who shines a light. Uh, the death cart would uh, they would try to do all of that at night. He also cries out to warn people to hide their eyes to not to not watch what was happening. 
This is a um, uh, uh, Milan's uh, most famous early photographer who gives you some sense of the very size of this, um, this structure. What I find really interesting here, the, the date that's cut off is that it's, um, uh, it, it, or it's cut off on my screen, um, is, uh, it, it is 1880. Within the next few years, this entire complex would disappear. And then this picture is remade. It's a deliberate uh, attempt to recover and promote uh, a memory, uh, a lived connection. Here, the, the, the detail uh, of a street map from 1860. There's more um, uh, of this, this whole area that's being refashioned, modernized. Um, this is the great, uh, in Milanese language, it's called Fopone, and in that it was renamed in the Napoleonic era to Cemetery of San Gregorio. It had disappeared by the time the painting was redone. So all of this painting here, this is where, this is where out of the, the dead from the Lazaretto come in. And once again, we see all the little people, the dead on a cart, the dead on the ground, and people at work in this. The busyness of quarantine uh, for um, the people who didn't have the privilege of staying in their house. This is the um, Giovanni Battista Rossellini is, um, is the person who reworked this painting because it was so important and it was falling into disrepair. It was so important to um, the people who lived in, uh, in the district where the prior had originally served. They're dock workers. They were um, uh, coal unloaders. It was already a fossil fuel. Um, uh, time period in 1630. So um, you can you can see some. I used uh, another a kind of remembered picture of what the dock would have looked like. This was a, a pouch out from the Navigal Canal. The Milanese steadily over the Middle Ages built these ca these canals so that they could bring the great marbles from the Alpine area into Milan. Invented a series of locks, making one little section near the Lazaretto. So uh, navigable was an, uh, an achievement of Leonardo da Vinci when he was there. Uh, you see in the background the great cathedral where, um, uh, if you saw Andrea Bocelli's uh, Easter concert, uh, you will recognize its, you know, wedding cake-like appearance. And this, um, finally, uh, image, I don't know, I'm, I, I'm out of time here, is to show you a place that I know I passed by six or seven times at least in walking around Milan. It's actually right here is where this memory uh, is uh, to this very day um, uh, replaced. So in sum, I, I, um, uh, uh, the issues of memory um, and, and of space, um, we need to rethink, to reconnect to the past. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Anne, for um, that very powerful presentation. And it's it, it's fascinating to look through those paintings with you. And I, and I appreciate your, your shared knowledge tonight. We have a, a lot of people very interested in uh, multiple aspects of your talk. And we'll ask about them a little bit at the end of the program, um, particularly the, the production of death that was sort of represented in the architectural layout of the images that you, that you showed uh, previously. Um, but we're looking forward to catching up with you in, in, in just a few minutes. Um, thank you, Anne. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Kalani Craig, and Kalani is a clinical assistant professor in the Department of History at IU Bloomington, and she's also a co-director of the Institute for Digital Arts and Humanities. Uh, Kalani is one of my favorite people to run into on campus because she's just so smart about so many different things. Um, her teaching and research mainly focuses on digital methodologies, uh, digital history, and medieval history. And she uses digital methods like text mining, spatial history, and network analysis to explore conflict in uh, European history, particularly medieval European history. And she's currently teaching a course on the Black Death. I'm sure it's fascinating, and her students are very lucky to have her uh, in the classroom. Uh, Kalani will be discussing a plague simulation that she has developed that focuses on the bubonic plague. And the title of her talk is uh, Plaguescapes and Memory Fields. 
Uh, thank you, Kalani. Please take it away. Thanks, Ed. Um, I have to uh, first say thank you to Anne for bequeathing the class to me. Uh, she taught it before I did, and I worked with her on one version of it when she was leading the classroom. So um, some of what you're seeing is a direct result of some of the talk that came before me. Um, I also want to take Anne's lead here and cheat. I have two objects, but they're very related. Um, and the one I'm showing uh, here on my screen in just a moment is, um, is one of them, and it is an illustration that's sitting in my office. I'm thankful that I have a screen capture of it um, here with me at home. Uh, it's an illustration from a class, and it's sort of like giving away the last part of a novel uh, without reading the first part. Um, we're going to come back to it at the end, but what I want you to pay attention to are the little yellow grid lines and the little yellow red, uh, the, the little red dots, um, because these are student produced um, samples that come out of a series of classes that include a computer simulation that was designed to solve one of the really big problems that I struggle with in the Black Death course, which is that students sort of think of the past as dirty and gross and, um, and of, of responses to plague as very much uh, panicked and, and that they themselves as modern people in a modern world with modern medicine would not respond that way. So how do we do that? Um, one of the things that I've done to make that work is to show them their world, to use modern tools to break modern context. And I have an advantage here, this is Bloomington. All these little colored lines on the map of Bloomington are student walking paths that they used the GPS on their cell phones to track for 24 hours to give them a better sense of what it's like to walk in 24 hours. How far um, can they go? How much distance can they cover? And the advantage here is that Bloomington and the walls around 5th, 6th century Constantinople when plague breaks out in 542 under the reign of Justinian I are about the same, six-ish square miles. Um, but we're talking about some population density differences. So here's where we start thinking about the data aspect of modeling ancient historical plagues. Um, and one of the things that, that that is rooted in, that the exercise is rooted in, is this idea that, um, that there are poles between data and anecdote, the collection of things that are theoretically objective versus the anecdotes of people like John of Ephesus, who wrote an ecclesiastical history in the 580s um, covering the plague. Um, in which he describes the scourge that's, that wiped over the, the Mediterranean in the sixth century as something like a wine press of God's wrath that squished the people in the Mediterranean like fine grapes. Um, it's a very vivid description and students often ignore it because it is so anecdotal, because it's so dramatic, because it's so singular. Um, so that, that belief in objective data in lots and lots of numbers, lots and lots of, of um, examples of things. And here I've got an example of what, one of the things we're seeing in this current pandemic from the uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Um, this is one of the visualizations that's been floating around the interwebs um, as we encounter our own pandemic. This is more, more easily believable because it feels static. It feels like people didn't interpret it in a particular way. So we can break that by using these tools, by using these comparisons to give a better sense of what it's really like to move in the world the way that someone might have moved in Constantinople. And the first way we do that is by showing people that when you overlay the city walls of Constantinople with the, the parts of Bloomington that as we know best as we move around campus and its environs, um, that this is about how far you can get. Um, and then we have them take that experience into Constantinople using primary sources. So we read Procopius, who was Justinian's secretary. We read stories about priests distributing food, and they use those same tools to imagine what it might have been like to walk around about that same distance with specific goals in mind in Constantinople, except this time what we can talk to them about is population density. And so here we're, we're looking at some things that, that both Anne and Colin talked about. The population density in Bloomington is about 120,000 people in that six square miles, roughly. Population density in Constantinople on the high end, according to archaeological numbers, is um, 800,000. Probably it was about 500,000, but I like to exaggerate it just a little bit for the sake of, um, of fun. And then we see what happens when you use agent-based modeling 
So these are the epidemiological tools that folks in the industry use to look at, um, at statistical computer models of what it might look like to um, move plague around in um, parts of the, the world where population density differs. And here I'm actually going to skip to the live model. Um, on the left hand side of my screen, you can see uh, if I set up a modern college town and I press go, um, we have these uh, a few people um, who are infected with plague at the beginning. These are the folks who are yellow. We have a few people who have little brown squares around them. These are the folks who are sheltering in place. This is something that actually is uh, that comes up time and time again in the primary sources. People hunker down in their houses and they choose not to leave. And we can get a sense of how many people die. Um, the little skulls that pop up. Uh, the, the blue smiley faces have recovered from plague. When you set up Constantinople, it's a very different story. And here population density really, really brings the virulence of plague to the forefront. Um, this is pretty awful. Uh, we, we have students talking about just how gruesome it is. The first thing that they saw when they saw the first version of this um, were, were all the skulls popping up. And um, we've got a couple of students saying, holy shit, everyone died. Um, and that gets people's attention. It brings students who were sort of checked out of class back into the conversation because they want to know why their peers are, um, are swearing a little bit. But it also lets us do a few other things. One of the things that we take for granted when we do this kind of epidemiological simulation model is that the data that underlies it is pretty static, but it's based on numeric values that have a root in sick, not sick, or dead. But there's a whole host, as we're seeing, especially with this current pandemic, of sociocultural and economic issues that play a role in how people experience death, in how they actually die, in what means um, higher morbidity rates among different kinds of populations. So how do we represent the human experience in a simulation? And that's one of the things that the team um, that includes Joshua Danish and Charlie Mahoney, Joshua is in the School of Education here in IU, and Charlie Mahoney is now working for an educational research company in San Francisco, um, worked on the last time that we did a full redesign of the software from the ground up. And one of the questions we wanted to ask is what happens when um, one of the things in the primary sources begins to happen in the simulation, which is priests begin to run away. Some priests are refusing to do their duty. So a third of the dead won't perceive proper funeral rites. In the, the um, sixth century, um, Catholic confession happened once in a lifetime. It was something you did on your deathbed. And if you couldn't find a priest, uh, you might not end up where you wanted to. So we've been able to represent that with these terrifying little red skulls. But that wasn't the extent of the kind of, of, of experience that people in Constantinople might have, have gone through as they watched people around them die. Um, we have refrigerator trucks in New York outside of hospitals waiting for bodies to come out because the morgues and the funeral services are overwhelmed. When Constantinople, the equivalent is that our grave diggers um, and our burial services also begin to break down. There are stories of Justinian spending his money, but his representative, um, Theodorus, spending personal money to help continue the burials of folks who were buried and who died of plague in Constantinople. And when you add that, to the priests and you begin to see these little prone orange bodies building up in the streets, um, it gives you a different sense of what it was like to live through plague. So we extended that a little bit um, in the years that followed this initial simulation, which we did in 2016, um, in part because one of the things that we really wanted to do was use this to help students move between different plague outbreaks. Um, the version of the Black Death class that I, that I teach starts with the Justinianic plague in the sixth century, but we also have to tackle the, the plague in 1348, and the plague in 1348 happens in different environments. Uh, there's, we still see plague in these very large urban environments, but we also see plague in denser, smaller environments. So on the right hand side, we have Bloomington, which looks kind of like you, it, it would if we had run the original simulation on the left. But this time we underlaid it with a map of Bloomington. It's a little bit dim so that the, um, 
simulation icons still show up. But we wanted to show students what it looked like when you take the basically the same population and put it in a 1.6 square mile area. This is Siena, Italy, um, one of the towns in which we have a significant amount of plague primary source, both written and um, architectural. Um, and, and it's a very different story here when you see the kind of narrow confines. Um, Colin talked about the, the population density in some of the apartments in Rome and the ways in which people were crowded and cramped. And this move back and forth between the larger environs of a college town that is essentially um, rural in nature and the very, very narrow confines of a town that would have been much more dense and much more crowded because it's in a smaller space, begin to push students as they think about what it was like to experience sources talking about being squeezed in the, the press of God's uh, wrath. We also wanted students to really think through what they would add. So we didn't just stop there. We asked students as an activity to add humanity to this by adding other variables, other things that they could, um, and the, the term that we use to turn um, experiences into variables is operationalizing something. What, how you would operationalize something like starvation, something like hunger, um, so that um, the structure that we're working with are, um, are giving them a much better sense of what it was like to lose um, the, the world around them that was full of farming, that was full of work, that was full of uh, the, the humanity of the fields and urban environments alike. And what we got out of that were students responding by saying that the inevitability of death in Constantinople and the density of the people, the visualizing of something that really didn't seem very serious meant something to them. You wouldn't think that these primary source authors are real. We were able to bring something real to the descriptions that came from someone's writing by giving students an imagined plague simulation. Um, I wanna think about what that means for data though. Um, as we bring, instead of pushing data and anecdote apart and belief and disbelief apart, what it means to bring them together. Uh, the word that we use in the digital humanities is CAPTA. Um, what it means to think about every point in a data set being a person, being an experience that someone has individually, and then that data set becoming an aggregate of all of those people's individual descriptions. Um, we also want to, and I'm drawing on, on Carolyn Cinder's work on feminist data here. Um, I also want to think about the idea that data is easier to believe when it's part of the worldview that we already have. We, we already collectively reshape what we're willing to believe about the world around us. And here, Julian Chambliss's work on the Black imaginary and, and the idea that Wakanda, the city that we saw in the recent Avengers movies, um, wouldn't have been possible in the 60s when Black Panther first came out as a comic, that we are only now um, as a society ready to, to um, imagine a black urban space in which technology is far ad uh, more advanced than any of the rest of the world. Um, and thinking about it that way really does bring us back to some of the structures that shape the way that we look at data. Um, 538 has just gone through and looked at the, the reasons that um, the data that we have um, are, are structured around a whole series of questions about the coronavirus that we don't have um, control over. Some countries are testing fully, some countries are not. Uh, the Devil in the Data, another article that The Wire has um, sent around lately, has really given us a sense of what kinds of problems are coming out of models like the IHME from the University of Washington that I started with. And with that, what I wanna do is come back to the student illustration the data and anecdote here um, that, that brings the students' work with these simulations together with their reading of primary sources, with the working that, uh, together that they did of um, 
the, the primary sources that were visual and brought some of the paintings to life. And the students did too. Um, one of the things that they did as they were producing a plague artwork of their own was to draw the streets of Bloomington. So here you can see the 4546 bypass. Um, you can see uh, campus outlined here. That's the outline of the simulation. You can see the little red dots of the skulls that died. Um, this hellmouth, um, here's a medieval hellmouth. This is the, the illustration of people who, um, who were bad in life and got what they deserved in death. Um, there are hellmouths all over medieval artwork. And the students drew one around Kilroy's on Kirkwood, which has the highest rate of um, student underage drinking violations in Bloomington. So there's really a synthesis here um, of the idea of the three living and the three dead, that anyone can catch plague and that it affects all of us equally. And that when we really think through the ways that data enlightens anecdote and anecdote enlightens data, that's when history can help us as we navigate the spaces in which we ourselves are sitting in the middle of a pandemic. Thank you, Kalani. Um, uh, amazing work. And it really is fascinating to switch not just from um, historical plague to historical plague, but to switch uh, historical models uh, working from text and sculptures to paintings to uh, data sets and, and quantifications. And I, I really appreciate uh, the stretch here. I'm also hoping I can get a, a Kilroy's t-shirt with the Hellmouth on it sometime soon. Uh, I'd, I'd have to ask permission from the students who drew it. I think they would need to get the, the royalties. <laughs> I wear it proudly. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, okay, so our last speaker uh, of the evening is uh, William Schneider, Bill Schneider. He's Professor Emeritus of History at IUPUI. Uh, he's a professor of medical humanities and health studies. His work for, focuses on the history of science and medicine, French history and 20th century Europe, uh, global health, and, um, sorry about that, uh, and humanitarian assistance. Uh, he's the author of Quality and Quantity, The Quest for Biological Regeneration in 20th Century France, as well as The History of Blood Transfusion in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'm gonna let him introduce his object to you. Uh, it's, it's quite impressive as an object. Uh, the title of his talk is Emerging Viruses and Pandemics, Lessons from HIV slash AIDS. Uh, welcome to the program. Bill, please take it away. Okay, thank you. So um, you can see my object here. Uh, it's a bit unusual. <clears throat> I used it for a class that I taught for years on the history of medicine uh, to tell students about diseases and where diseases came from. Uh, and the point being that um, the majority of the infectious diseases that we humans have uh, come from animals, uh, birds and so on. Uh, obviously this was done after 9-11 and there was a more subtle point here, which is that um, a disease can be just as bad or threatening as terrorism. And uh, as of course, as it turned out uh, today, this is uh, something that's um, obviously one of the lessons that I think we're learning. Um, the uh, subject of this talk is a much more recent plague. It's in fact, the current epidemic of HIV and AIDS that's still going on. Uh, being more recent, there's a lot that's been studied about it, and of course it's difficult to uh, capture all of that in a very short talk. So I'm focusing on the question of uh, the emergence of uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, because it's the thing that uh, I've been um, uh, working on. Now, I should talk a bit about um, how I came to work on this subject. Oops. And uh, it started about 10 or 15 years ago when I was asked by a virologist and an epidemiologist um, if I knew anything about the history of blood transfusion in Africa. These two people were working on the question of the origin of AIDS, uh, which you would think would be a subject of interest, but the origin is once uh, you identify sort of the animal, then people just kind of uh, are much more concerned with ending or avoiding the plague that are the disease that's confronting them. And so the question of origin, especially to make sure there's no more coming along, uh, seems to be left as a secondary importance. But they were working on the question of the emergence of the HIV virus, which uh, produces AIDS. Uh, 
And uh, it's ultimately a historical question when they were running into questions about the history of where the disease emerged that they couldn't answer. So I had done some you know, work in the history of Africa and history of transfusion. You'll see where transfusion comes in in a minute. And so when I started uh, working with them and realizing my uh, skills and knowledge was limited, uh, we brought in step by step a number of other people, uh, Africanists, uh, anthropologists, and um, they joined the group of about 10 people. One of the experts, it turned out, was someone in our own department of history at IUPUI, Didier Gondola, who was the world's expert on Kinshasa, formerly Leopoldville, which was one of the most important places where the uh, AIDS epidemic developed. And so for the last 10 or 15 years, we've been working on this. And I should point out, this is an example of not just uh, the humanities and social sciences, being useful to remember and analyze things, but we're actually, we're able to participate in the scientific question of the emergence of the virus. So uh, that's uh, worth thinking about. So let's uh, start with the question of uh, where the virus has come from. And here's just a short list of some of the more common infectious diseases that we know of, but you may not have known where they come from. Uh, you can see in the left-hand column, uh, the animals, uh, many of whom live with us, <laughs> or uh, we come close to. Uh, you can also tell that these are fairly old viruses uh, that originated when we first domesticated these animals, and people tended to live with them. Uh, there's only a few newer ones on the bottom, influenza and AIDS, which are new uh, viruses. Now, uh, this is a list of all the viruses discovered since 1901, from 1901 to 2005, which uh, should send a shudder down your back, because these viruses are still emerging and still coming into existence, from uh, most of them from animals. Uh, the good news, uh, this is a list that starts slowly and then increases as our knowledge gets better. But of the two or 300 diseases here, luckily, uh, not many of them have become epidemic. Uh, here's a few that we're familiar with, hepatitis B, Ebola, and HIV, uh, which have become epidemic. And so uh, this is uh, further evidence of this point of where these viruses come from. Now, the reason very few of them become epidemic, and frankly, given our contact with animals, how few become viruses, is that they're complicated. So this is a somewhat complicated illustration, but it shows how uh, these viruses or these diseases get from animals to humans. And so if you look on the left, the one that we think of most uh, frequently is the one that's the least common, and it's rabies. Rabies is a disease that's carried, we usually think of it uh, with dogs, but it can be other animals. Uh, the animal bites you and you get sick. Uh, that's how the disease is passed, from the animal to the human. Humans don't give rabies to other humans, although I suppose you might bite someone. Um, Ebola is like the rest of them, and then what they do is they pass through other animals to eventually get to humans. So here you can see that Ebola, which uh, we've identified as coming from bats, typically infect a, an animal, in this case probably a primate. The primate then infects the human, and then the human can then infect other humans uh, as the virus adapts from what's in the uh, animal and then can be passed between humans. Dengue fever is similar. And AIDS, uh, the HIV virus of AIDS, as we'll find out, comes from a simian virus in uh, monkeys and great apes, which had to adapt and evolve before it could be passed between humans. Uh, the simian virus, as we'll see, doesn't make a human sick uh, with uh, uh, the immune virus, the immunosuppression virus, but it had to adapt to become a virus that could be passed between humans. So a few features about AIDS that you may or may not remember or be familiar with uh, are listed here. It's a new virus. Uh, actually, there's more than one. Uh, it's caused by several HIV viruses that uh, adapted from simian viruses, which exist in uh, various primates in Africa. Over 40 of the uh, primates in Africa have these simian viruses, but the human viruses adapted from only three of those. 
the earliest estimate of when the adaptation took place is around 1920, although others uh, were adapted later. The, vi the virus is passed between humans through bodily fluids, and this risk of passage varies uh, depending on the particular means. Sexual intercourse, the one we're most familiar with, uh, will be surprising to you uh, that it's a fairly low risk. Uh, the risk can vary depending on how high the viral load is. And sterile needles, uh, somewhat uh, higher risk. Much greater risk is the passage between uh, mother and uh, in utero uh, or else through uh, breastfeeding. Uh, the maternal newborn is basically 25%. And of course, the almost certain passage of uh, uh, the HIV is through blood transfusion, uh, which is almost 100%. So it's not airborne are born by vector, which are a much more efficient way of transmitting viruses, except for the transfusion and the maternal newborn, which are uh, close to the uh, efficiency of airborne viruses. Another key feature about uh, AIDS uh, and HIV is that after an initial symptoms of something like flu or aching joints, uh, the immune system of the humans uh, suppresses it and suppresses it for quite a long time, but doesn't eliminate it and it go, is asymptomatic for as much as 10 years, which is one of the crucial and most devastating things about it because symptomatic people are able to pass it to others without knowing it, at least until you can develop the test. Uh, the way that HIV works is that it doesn't attack an organ that dies like the heart or the lungs. It attacks the immune system itself, taking up to 10 years. Once it's successful, then the immune system is no longer able to ward off other, what are called opportunistic infections, otherwise quite rare, rare cancers and others, as well as pneumonia. And of course, the final and most devastating thing about uh, HIV and AIDS is that it's 100% lethal, at least until the development of treatment. So the response to AIDS is uh, similarly summarized here in this. Uh, it was in 1981 that these opportunistic infections first appeared uh, in a homosexual men in Los Angeles and New York. It took a while to figure out uh, just what it was, the means of transmission, um, including the delay between infection. And it took a full year to actually come up with a name that uh, described it, AIDS. Uh, you may or may not know it was originally associated with gays and called gay-related immunodeficiency syndrome. Uh, it took a couple of years before the virus itself was discovered in a kind of a race between the Pasteur Institute and NIH, which uh, Montaigne at Pasteur won. Uh, two more years before a test was developed. You can start drawing your own conclusions about what's going on now. Um, and testing was able to, was crucial in not only telling who had it, but a variety of other things. A second uh, virus was discovered in 1986, which was quickly named HIV-2, and it came from a completely different animal source. And uh, after that, as, uh, uh, to date, other genetically distinct forms of HIV have been found in totaling 13 of them, uh, four of them coming from the uh, animal group in Central Africa, which we'll see in a minute, two of which became epidemic, and nine uh, separate uh, HIV transmission uh, adaptations from an animal, uh, two of which became epidemic. The chimpanzees, gorillas, and monkeys with these SIVs uh, are now recognized as the reservoirs from which these 13 separate crossovers occurred to produce the HIV-1 and HIV-2 subgroups. Uh, it was only beginning in the late 18, uh, 1980s and into the mid-1990s that a multi-drug therapy was developed for AIDS. We've heard a lot about uh, the curve, uh, flattening the curve. Well, here's the curve for HIV and AIDS, and it's flattened, not ended, after 30 years, 40 years, and it's quite depressing when you look at the numbers. The peak of the pandemic in 2004 saw 1.7 million deaths. Total number of deaths to date, 35 million. As of the latest report from UNAIDS for the year 2018, still 770,000 deaths, 1.7 million new cases. 
why it's not on the headlines in the United States uh, is the fact that uh, the numbers of new cases and the deaths in the United States, relatively speaking, are less than the rest of the world, although far greater than uh, the number of deaths uh, from Ebola. But that's a question of consciousness and reporting and a variety of other things. So turning to the question of the uh, emergence and origins, this is a complicated slide, but here you can see the um, animals from which the two viruses came, HIV-2 from Sudi Mangabe monkeys in West Africa along the coast, and gorilla and chimpanzees in Central Africa, Cameroon. <clears throat> uh, we found out that the gorilla was actually infected from the chimpanzee, so the chimpanzees are really uh, the source. How this was done was by gene sequencing of viruses, so I'm told, uh, and then because uh, most of these animals' genes have been sequenced when the human sequences were done, they could put them in a computer program and see which were the closest to which, and this is how they found that the HIV ones, these are actually the numbers of chimpanzee sequences or gorilla sequences, and um, this is just for HIV-1. And uh, it's quite fantastic uh, work that was done to identify these um, viruses and their animal sources. So here's a list of them which shows some of the differences between these uh, various strains of HIV. Uh, you can see that they vary quite a bit in the number of people infected. Uh, the biggest, most important one group, uh, HIV-1 group M, uh, which has infected and killed over 90% of the people around the world, uh, originated in the Congo. Uh, it was discovered, the, the virus was discovered in 1983, but the emergence of the virus, we think, goes back to the 1920s. Um, a second one that was confined to Cameroon, Group O, uh, emerged probably in the 1930s. We'll see more of this later. Uh, the other group that uh, was in the West African coast, two of which became epidemic, uh, emerged in the 1930s and 1940s. And so you can see that they varied in their time and their place and in their virulence. So the most widely held explanation that's repeated to this day of the emergence of, of HIV is that uh, there was a jump from the simian virus in chimpanzees in southeastern Cameroon around 1920 uh, to a cut hunter. Hunters uh, of chimpanzees uh, hunted them for meat, and if a hunter has a cut on a hand and is butchering the uh, chimp, and the chimp sim uh, simian virus could easily pass to the hunter. That virus then made its way down the Sangha uh, River and the Congo River to Kinshasa or Leopoldville, uh, as it was called before independence uh, and uh, before 1970s. Uh, and there in Kinshasa, according to this explanation, the so-called epicenter of the so-called perfect storm produced the epidemic because of the population density, the rapid population growth and concentration, prostitution, and uh, later, uh, as we'll see, medical campaigns using unsterile uh, needles for injections. From Kinshasa, then, the uh, virus passed up the transportation routes to the rest of the Congo and into East Africa uh, and into Angola, and uh, from there to the rest of the world, the United States uh, and Europe. Now, there's a number of questions about this explanation about the emergence and epidemic spread of HIV. First and most obvious is that it only explains one viral emergence. Of course, the most important one, HIV-1M, but what about the other HIVs? How did they emerge and where did they emerge and why did they emerge? Humans have hunted chimps and monkeys for tens of thousands of years. Why would HIV emerge now? Now, um, the answer uh, that's given uh, if it's even questioned, is that uh, it was a chance occurrence. Uh, possibly the chances were increased because of increased hunting uh, through perhaps the introduction of guns uh, in colonial uh, Africa. Now it's true that uh, chimp human infection is not a simple zoonosis like rabies where the animal gives you the disease. Uh, 
Uh, but our use, uh, research by the anthropologists who did field work in Central Africa was that uh, guns were little used, they're still little used now, uh, and there was no real increase in hunting. Other researchers who have worked on Leopoldville and prostitution have found that the population of Leopoldville increased only slowly until 1945, and that what's been called prostitution by uh, the explanation uh, before 1945 was much more like concubinage of African women with colonial men, not the multi-partner commercial sex that we think of nowadays. A couple of other problems with the explanation uh, is that these 12 HIV strains occurred uh, at different times in different places, so they could hardly be produced by chance. Uh, and we also have found that the epidemic uh, uh, in Kinshasa wasn't repeated elsewhere. So the explanation that we've come across is first produced by uh, Preston Marx is that the crossover as well as the epidemic was the result of increased human uh, to human infections, not simian to humans. Now this is quite complicated. I'll actually skip the verbiage and show you the diagram. Uh, if the animals bite a human, they will not get HIV. They'll suppress the infection. But if within about six weeks, the human passes an unadapted virus to another human, uh, that virus figures out a way to uh, survive longer. And if within six weeks that can be passed to another human, it begins to take on the shape of a human virus that can be passed between humans, and so it adapts. This is basically, basically speeded up evolutionary adaptation. So uh, the crossover uh, by our conclusions is that uh, the epidemic was the result of human to human infections, uh, and not simply simian to human infections through the process of serial passage. What then can we say produce the increase of human human infections? And here's where the historians and the anthropologists come in. The most often uh, practices cited are sexual intercourse, concentration in urban cities, and new medical procedures. What we found is that, of course, sexual intercourse didn't change much. And so it's hard to say that it's produced all of a sudden the virus. In fact, sexual intercourse is the least efficient. So the virus had to be more fully adapted. Urban concentration may have been the case in Leopoldville, but that was not the case with the other viruses. And the one thing that seems to be most common elsewhere are the new medical procedures, much more ubiquitous, and of course unwitting and unintentional, unsterile needles used in disease campaigns, and the increased use of blood transfusion. And here's some pictures that give you some dates and show uh, how, for example, vaccinations in the Ivory Coast were done you know, over a million before World War I. And so hundreds of thousands of people were uh, vaccinated, which did a good thing, uh, but without having sufficient sterilization, it could pass a virus that was in one human to another human. So uh, obviously the explanation of the emergence of the viruses for AIDS needs to explain all the emergence of viruses the understanding of history and social history and cultural history is important for understanding it. Uh, the passage of pathogens between humans is key and medical procedures seem to be the key to understanding it. Lessons that we can draw from uh, for today, uh, the, some of the obvious ones, people shouldn't live in close proximity with undomesticated animals. Disposable needles should be used uh, for injections. Symptoms of potential new viruses must be watched closely and immediately monitored and reported. And above all, it needs to be done on a worldwide scale. Thank you uh, very much. And we'll see if there's questions. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for that fascinating presentation. Um, such, such amazing research in your career. And I, I really appreciate you sharing it with us tonight. Um, I think that we're going to bring all our speakers uh, onto the screen at this point. Good to see you all again. Uh, I really want to express my gratitude for your participation in this first episode. Uh, my, my, my brain is just uh, zinging with connections between the talks. I feel like a giddy undergraduate uh, walking between classes. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I, I have a few questions uh, based off of the comments that we've been receiving uh, on Facebook from our audience. Um, I guess I, I would, I, I'll ask three questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, I'd like to start uh, with Colin and Anne. Everyone's sort of digging this, this pantheon of, of plague heroes and villains from the past. Um, 
thinking about Commodus as well as St. Rosalia. Um, it's interesting to, to consider who are the, who are the kind of heroes and villains in, in contemporary culture and the ways that um, sort of larger than life personalities develop uh, based on the, 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 the current conditions that we're all experiencing. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about the, the sort of the, the, the culture of celebrity that surrounds uh, the current uh, crisis and the ways that uh, people are turning to public figures uh, at this moment. Colin, do you have anything to say about that? Boy. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I, I tried not to draw too many explicit comparisons between Commodus and, and, uh, and our, our the U.S. President Donald Trump, but and I didn't want to do that, you know, just to be crass. But uh, there, there are some. There are definitely some, and uh, you, you know, I, I, I guess I'll speak more about the past and dodge your question just a little bit, sure. maybe because I don't entirely want. It. What, what I'll just say is this: um, the, the interesting thing about the Antonine Plague is that celebrity was magnified in this plague. The 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 fact that we have uh, at least one or maybe two emperors that actually get the plague. So Lucius Verus, uh, the, the, there were two emperors before Commodus, Marcus Aurelius' his father, and then Lucius Verus, uh, the, uh, this, this, the other emperor. Lucius Verus may have gotten that disease. And we also know that uh, the tutor of Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius also got the disease. And uh, Galen, the famous physician, was writing about the disease. So, and Cassius Dio wrote about the disease. So the fact that these, uh, these leading figures in the Roman, the city of Rome and in the Roman Empire were either experiencing the disease directly or writing about it, I think has left an impression that this was quite uh, a devastating pandemic. So one of the things that I said uh, at the beginning of my talk that I gave a wide range of mortality figures, anything between 1 million and 5 million. And we don't know much about this disease. And one of the things that makes it so difficult to diagnose as to the impact is because you have these celebrity figures that have, that their, their voice is so strong. And so what I guess I'll say about the modern situation with coronavirus is we're in the same situation now where our leaders have tremendous influence over how serious we take the disease, over the sorts of measures that we take, not just in terms of naked sort of state power, the ability to enforce certain laws. Trump, Donald Trump may, may think that he has total authority. He, of course, doesn't. Um, but he does have tremendous influence. And even some of the things that he has said in terms of the recommendations that he's given uh, and other bits of pseudoscience or alternative facts, as, as one of his spokespeople once called it. Um, these have tremendous power to influence the way that people actually behave. And so for better or for worse, uh, yeah, that does have a huge impact and will going forward as we figure out either how to reopen, when to reopen, whether that's a safe thing to do, um, our leaders will have a, a, a huge impact on that. And that can be either troubling or comforting depending on, on those leaders. Thank you. Thanks. Anne, would you like to add anything? Um, I, I would say for the early modern period, um, there were formal histories written. I mean, it became, became uh, very important in the 1570s and then again in the 1630s. Um, these books that, that uh, summarize the plague in this place. Um, just as there were saints being uh, formed, uh, new saints to, uh, attached to these plagues. The formal histories are written by noblemen who have access to the records, and they talk about what the rich and the powerful did. So if you want a more positive story, there's a recent uh, book called Florence Under Siege, which shows um, the young 21-year-old uh, uh, Duke uh, uh, of Flo um, Medici Duke of Florence, who uh, is all on the street, who is a visible um, sign of leadership, which the people supposedly found this extremely reassuring. In the archival records, and especially where they have survived and in smaller places, um, what, there is the remembering the essential personnel, 
and the helper. So there's one small place uh, outside Palermo, which really gets slammed. They borrow Rosalia's skull uh, for, um, and, uh, uh, but they, right down to the washerwomen and the people who purged and purified houses and the like, they remember those. And I think that that resonates to what we're all, when we're in quarantine, we're, we're thinking about those people who have to be out and about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, the the next question is is sort of geared towards I think Anne and Kalani's presentation, and uh, a number of people were struck um, by the image of the pest house uh, in in the, the the painting that Anne showed, and particularly the the sort of the factory like production and management of disease and death in that period. And I know that our viewers are also very interested in the, the, the idea of quantifying death. Um, the sort of, both of these suggest different forms of rationalization. And, and as you were both speaking, I was getting um, news feeds on my computer with just numbers of, of, of infected and death tolls and comparisons between countries. I mean, I'm really, more than anything else, um, the, the news that I'm inundated with is, is numerical uh, at, at this point in time. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious, is there, is this something that persists through history that, that the, the kind of conf confrontation with massive suffering and death through rational or quantifiable means? Um, is there anything distinct about today's um, numbers and the, the kind of interest, the public interest in numbers and reporting numbers uh, from the past? Um, I'm wondering if we could kind of think through any distinctions between the current moment in this regard and the past. I'm thinking about some of the sources from the sixth century plague. Um, I'm going to let Anne talk about John Grant, um, <laughs> but uh, because I think the there's a little bit in there. Um, we just covered historical demography in the 1665 plague, where where we really do start tracking that information. Um, but, but a lot of the earlier sources. Um, I think what you see is what the students were in, in my classrooms have tended to struggle to see, which is the overwhelming, emotionally dampening nature of all of that death around you that makes it hard to, um, and that makes it hard to address when quantification and data aren't as much a part of the world. We still have census um, that are, that, that's part of the sort of uh, late Roman world, we still have um, a sense of, of currency control. You see Diocletian setting prices in the third century to sort of control some of that. So there's really clearly numeracy happening. But I think it doesn't have the same daily penetration, right? The, we literally have an entire science called data science, and it is the thing that all the parents want their kids to take in college. So the emphasis on those numbers are unusual, I think, and it is one of the pieces of this, this plague that is going to stand out um, because we're really seeing numbers as the primary factor of, of reporting. But those numbers are so widely varying in how they're collected that I think that's also going to be one of the stories we tell. Yeah. And well, I, was, I wasn't going to talk about John Grant. I was going to say <laughs> Italy. <laughs> Uh, liking it um, uh, in those formal histories uh, and uh, versus archival records. Um, right. The other thing that people latch on to um, is um, in writing formal histories is the numbers, how many uh, people, the, the numbers climbing, when it doubles, what happened. And in fact, it's why you get these stories of an, an incredible cruelty um, uh, blaming various workers or people stealing uh, from the dead or that that sort of thing and uh, uh, in Milan are the most horrible stories um, for for that kind of thing but that that the English did not invent that that sense of quantifying and um, uh, and counting it's just in uh, in England it becomes public the the it, it, like it is on Twitter like it is, you know, there, there are daily reports from, uh, you know, there um, that, that we, can, we can follow the numbers someplace else. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's, it, it's a big difference today. We don't really understand it. We know that there's not adequate testing. Mm 
And so mm -hmm. trying to read through those numbers is what Defoe's narrator is doing in the Journal of the Plague Year, trying to decode what, uh, what those bills of mortality are really actually telling them. So I'll stop there. That's a great, that's a great example to turn to. Um, I, have, I have two last questions, and they're, they're really for the whole group because you're all uh, historians. Uh, but I, I, maybe we'll start with Bill. Um, this, this came directly from the feed. Uh, what kind of information during this current crisis will be critical for future generations to study? Um, uh, what's, what's you, what, what is this crisis adding to the historical record of epidemics uh, and disease? Uh, how, how would you forecast that, uh, Bill? What we'll be talking about with future students? Well, it depends on what kind of students. I'd probably divide them between the sort of medical scientific biomedicine students and then the sort of socio-cultural historical students. So there's a tremendous amount to be learned from uh, for epidemiology, public health, uh, and disease about just why there's more people dying in New York than somewhere else. There's all these questions that we don't know now, which will ultimately, and, and even where it emerged and, and, and whether or not there's different strains and so on. So there's a whole series of, of uh, things about the, uh, what's happening medically <clears throat> and biomedically that, that'll be important. And then secondly, there'll be sort of the political, social, cultural understanding, reaction, uh, as, uh, as, as well as the kind of um, policy uh, actions that, that, that are all part of it, which will be a whole second group and we'll have I mean, given the nature of society and all the recordings, not just of statistics, but, you know, clippings and what you say in a press conference, uh, that'll be ample fodder for uh, subsequent historians to ask about. I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote. I got a call about a week or so ago from um, somebody at IU Health. <laughs> He's actually the uh, vice president for ethics who said he got my name because I knew I worked in the history of medicine and he wanted to ask me if there was anything that the people handling the crisis at IU Health Hospital should be paying attention to and preserving as a historian. And I said, whoa, <laughs> something that historians can help with. And so we got together and he walked me through how they do this cri crisis management is, is all done by scenario from um, the uh, 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 emergency management people. And so you follow a certain set pattern, but they don't tell you what records to preserve. So we went through and told them, you know, first of all, don't throw anything away. Um, second of all, uh, keep a diary. Have, have the main people keep a diary uh, and, uh, and a variety of things. So uh, there's some people that are even more self-conscious. Uh, hopefully there's more people like him, but uh, so there's a variety of kinds of records that I think will be useful. Yeah, that's, that's great. It brings us to the, maybe the last point. Um, in future ep episodes, we're going to be hearing about uh, a fascinating oral history project uh, coming out of IUPUI, uh, led by Jason Kelly. There's also a really great diary project ha happening at IU Bloomington, uh, run by Ka uh, Carrie Schweer and Sarah Knott. Um, one question that seems to be on a lot of people mi people's minds for this panel has to do with uh, memorialization. Uh, and, and I know you all have interest in this to some degree or another. Um, how will this moment be memorialized? And I know it's very, very early to, to think about this. Um, um, or or what, what would history suggest might be the ways we will or will not want to remember this time? Uh, which is a really fascinating question. Um, and how does this relate perhaps to the politics of memory? And I know we can't answer all of that. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if maybe one or two of you want to talk a little bit about memorialization um, and how you think that might be working today and how it might work out uh, in relationship to d different cultures um, in this time of coronavirus. I think Anyone there's one thing in? that, yeah, I think there's one thing, one really key piece of this, and we've all hand waved at it a little bit. I showed two news articles that were online and talked about Twitter. You talked about your Facebook feed. Um, how do we save all that? And that, I think that's part of the memorialization that's happening are those Facebook memes um, that have this day, the other day, yesterday, today, right? The ways that we're responding to this crisis as we sit in our homes connected by the internet. 
these are the things that aren't getting saved. Ian Milligan, History in the Age of Abundance, talks about what's going to happen to the history of the 90s because MySpace isn't available anymore. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that those digital archives that Ed just talked about are designed to solve. But I think that's where the memorialization on a sort of quotidian everyday experience kind of basis has to happen. And some of that is on us to save. Yeah, I'd just add that uh, plagues, of course, test our economic systems, and we're really focused on that right now, but they also test our social and cultural values as well. And when historians look back at this period, I think they'll look at how different nations responded, not so much as a way of evaluating their economic performance. Of course, we're really focused on that because we're in it and, and it's so important to us. But they'll look at, see, say, what, what did it reveal about their culture? What did it tell us that hordes of people in the United States bought as many much toilet paper as they could during the pandemic, a year's supply of toilet paper? And what does it tell us uh, about how other countries, you know, uh, for example, Japan or uh, Singapore, how they, um, you know, went went to wearing masks very early and and focused on, uh, you know, a much more car caring and and uh, less sort of self uh, interested approach as well. And this is true of historic pandemics. We can use them to evaluate cultural values, religious values. I'm thinking about what Kalani was talking about in that period, and also what Anne was, but they, we are creating a memory right now about what's important in our society that will be remembered, and we should be wise about that. That afterlife will live on far beyond us. Yes, Bill or Anne, do you have anything to add to that? Well, Anne, Anne's the expert on epidemics, but let me put in two cents, uh, and let me ask you a question. What do we remember about the AIDS pandemic? Uh, the quilt. Yeah, I mean, compared to those of us old enough to remember at the time, realize how dramatic and crucial and devastating it was. Um, nowadays, in the, of course, it depends on where you are. If you're in Africa, people know AIDS like we knew it in the 80s when you didn't know who had it and it was like a sentence of death and so on. Uh, from the standpoint of numbers, the numbers so far about what's going on to me are compared to other plagues, smaller. Certainly compared to the populations, large, huge numbers of populations affected. Um, and uh, the really significant thing is that uh, they happened in places that haven't had plagues in a while, uh, Europe and North America, at least since 1918. Uh, and that the only thing we had to combat it was this isolation that affects everybody. So it's something that do does affect everybody. That's probably the thing that's most uh, different compared to other plagues, um, at least in recent memory. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Can I just weigh in real quickly? Uh, I'll just say that um, zooming into people's private spaces is really, I mean, <laughs> look, at, look at us uh, here, is that that window into places you didn't really see if you, were, if you weren't close, but everybody is using Zoom or Skype or something like that. The other that I'm absolutely fascinated with is the, um, the clearing smog and the empty streets, the buildings, the cities, everything that we've built, except we're not in it. Um, so th that those uh, those make a, a kind of deep and lasting impression uh, about subtract us and what what does our world look like? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much, um, and and thanks again to all of you for letting us think along with you uh, as historians of of the past and the present moment and the and the future as well. Um, this has been a really enlightening uh, in so many ways. Um, I want to uh, just uh, appeal to our audience uh, to tune in again uh, next week. Uh, the topic for the week is uh, on suffering and solitude, and we'll be looking at the ways in which different artists and writers uh, throughout history have depicted um, experiences of, of suffering and solitude, um, as well as mourning and memory. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that discussion. Also, um, we host on Thursday evenings at 6 p.m., a program called Thursdays at Home, uh, which features um, artists and, and humanists and performers from IU um, doing their thing. Um, Ross Gay will be reading poetry uh, from his recent book on Thursday. Sarah Knott from the History Department will be talking about her book on, on motherhood. Um, we're really excited for this program as well, uh, but please join in uh, to the same Facebook page. Um, and then finally, I just want to give a, a shout out to our partners at the um, IU Bloomington Arts and Humanities Council, as well as Jason 
Kelly and the IUPUI Arts and Humanities Institute, as well as Indiana Humanities. Um, thanks so much for, for helping us pull the show together and we're looking forward to, to future episodes. Thank you everyone. Thanks to our panelists. Um, I hope everyone has a, a great night uh, <laughs> and stays healthy and safe. All best. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.